Hi, I'm Family Command. Welcome to the second episode of Obsolete. If you haven't seen the show, I advise you to go check out the first episode to get a good feel for it. Um, it's basically a show about old technology, showing what it can do, making it do new things, and maybe mixing in you know some newer stuff, uh, some reviews eventually, showcases, stuff like that. Now, I got a lot of feedback on the first episode. Most of it was positive. I realized I have to work on some of the camera work. The editing is a little shaky. I didn't really have everything exactly as I wanted it, but I was very eager to get something out. So I hope that the second episode is a lot better than the first episode production-wise. Um, but I did get lots and lots of very good feedback, and I hope to keep seeing that. But still, if you don't didn't like anything about the first episode, you don't like something about this episode, then you can always hit me up. I'll have links on how to do that in the credits. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to lead into the first segment, which is tone dialers and a little bit of red boxing. Now what you see in front of you here are pocket tone dialers. These use DTMF, which is known as dual tone multi-frequency. Um, if you look inside here, and even on here, there's a dial here which uses buttons. Now that's opposed to this rotary phone dial, which just has a spin. So you would dial by spinning this knob kind of thing right here. And so the main difference between that is that this phone uses pulse dialing. Now pulse dialing is just done by you switching the telephone line on and off using a series depending on which number you dialed, and that would make your number. DTMF came in in about, I think it's 1963 or 1964 as a way to replace this, because um, pulse dialing was subject to a number of problems, for example, if you're going, like, switching centers and long distance and stuff, there was problems if you need to get, like, a country code or something. And I also believe that pulse dialing degraded as it was going down the line, so that you may not get the number that you wanted depending on where you were. So with DTMF every number on the keypad here is made out of two tones and they're played together. There's a total of eight tones that are used and you can look up there's a grid that has all of the like the different hertz of the tones and which ones are played together and that's how that's done. Now if you look at the dialers here this is an early Radio Shack dialer. I've actually not found any documentation on these. Um, this model is 43140, and as you can see, it was made in August of '83. It's engraved right there. And um, this uses watch batteries. The newer models that everybody's talking about with red boxing, those use triple A's. They're slightly smaller. And I'll be talking a bit about red boxing later. But so you can see from the keypad here. There's a pause button, a dial button, manual to memory switch, an enter and store. It's for storing numbers. If you look here, it's a 32 memory pocket tone dial, which means it can store numbers. I have been unable to figure out how to store numbers on this. Um, I haven't found any documentation, so I'm not sure how to do that. And then on here, there's also a dial button on the side, so you can just click it. And then this is the part that you put on the phone. I'll be showing that in a bit later. And then, uh, as you can see from the top here, there's um, an eighth inch jack. I'm not sure why that's there. Someone before me who had this put that in there. It's not a standard feature. I'm not sure what they were using it for. If you can think of what they were using it for, you can drop me a line on that. But I'm not sure. I'll be showing you what I'm going to use it for in a bit later. But anyway, opening this up, see the circuit board here. So here's the speaker. You have battery compartment here. This board just does from the dial on the front, and this is the main circuit board here. If you look at the board, there's some interesting wiring done, like with this wire here, and there's some desoldering done here. I think someone who had this before me might have been doing something to it, I'm not sure. Still works as a dialer, but there might be something changed on it. Somebody might have improved the design. And um, with red boxing, there would be a crystal on this board. I'm not sure if this board even has the crystal that's done be changed with red boxing, but um, you would take the crystal and you would add a 6.55 megahertz crystal and you switch them out and then that would be able to allow you to produce 
tones you would need that could simulate coin tones. And I'll be talking more about red boxing in a little bit. So here's the board. Put that right away. But um, flip the cover up here. And you have your keypad, and you can dial any phone number, so I'll just... That's just a random phone number. Don't try calling it. And um, you could he probably hear the beeping that was made during that. If you actually have this tone dialer up against the phone, up against the headset, when you're dialing that, that sound will actually turn the phone off for some reason. So if you're going to dial a number using this type of tone dialer, do it before you have it held up to the phone. But then after I have that number in there, which is just dialed, I can hit the dial button here. And it plays it, or it can also hit the one on the side. It does the same number. Let me show you. I have my trusty Radio Shack mini amplifier here, which I've used before. I also have this eighth inch to eight inch cord. I'll put that in the jack of the tone dialer. Put the other end into my amplifier. Now using this, it gets kind of picky on what volume it has to be, or else it sounds awful, so I'll just go little by little. Right there. Hear that again? If I'm making your ears bleed because of that, I'm sorry. It's very finicky. I'm guessing that's one of the reasons that there could be a jack on top of here, I'm not sure yet. I have this other model of tone dialer over here. Now this is a Porta Touch 2 tone dialer, somebody trademarked tone dialer, you can see in the corner there. This has your standard like clicky buttons. And if you look down at the bottom here, there's an interesting indentation, which makes me think that originally there's going to be something else there. I'm not sure what would have been there, but the case makes it look like they're going to add something. On the back here, there's no label, there's nothing. I can't tell who made this, when they made it. I'm not entirely sure. I'll open it up. You can see the circuits here. You have the speaker, batteries, and then your PCB. It looks a lot simpler than the other one, so it might have come before it. And then you have the switch on the side right here. This does your volume, so if I put it up one, you probably can't hear that. Put it up another one, it's slightly louder. I'll show you that in a second right here. I have my telephone pickup, which I've showed before. You can just plop that on top. It promptly falls off. It's not very adhesive, that plastic. Then I have my mini amplifier speaker again. And I'll turn that on. Hear a little bit of the buzz. And then... Turn it off. Turn it on. You can hear that. Now I'm going to be demonstrating how to use this use this tone dialer with this rotary phone as opposed to using the rotary dial. I'm going to be hooking it up to this amplifier so you can hear it. I'm going to make sure it's a good volume. Right, you can hear that dial tone. Alright. I'm going to be using this tone dialer. I'm going to enter a phone number off camera. And I've entered that number. Play it for you once. Play it again. So we have our number in here. Call connected.
And then that's where I would leave my message. Hang up. Alright, so. As I said before, sometimes these tone dollars were used with red boxing. Now what would happen is that after replacing the crystal, you can see the asterisk button here, you would use combinations of the asterisk button to create your tones for your coins. And then you would use uh, preset buttons to save them. Now if you want to know, the, uh, the coin tones were uh, in America. They're used with a combination of um, two tones, 1700 hertz and 2200 hertz. And for five cents, for that tone, you would do 66 milliseconds of these two tones combined. If you wanted 10 cents, you'd do 62 milliseconds, and then you'd pause 60, I'm sorry, 66 milliseconds. You'd pause 66 milliseconds, and then you'd play 66 milliseconds again. For 25, that was a bit more complicated. You'd have 33 milliseconds on, and then 33 milliseconds off, and then you'd repeat that four more times, read it all of five times, and that would give you a quarter. Now, besides from the tone dialers, people um, have also been using stuff like MP3 players for red boxing. You can use CD players, or you can even use a simple cassette recorder. You could use a micro cassette recorder. I'm going to show you again with the eighth inch cord. I'll plug it into my MP3 player here. Plug the other end to the mini amplifier. Again, hopefully this is not too loud. But here's five cents. So there you go. And you can also have ten cents. And then finally, you have 25 cents. Now that one was a little bit faster, as you could hear. Now, when you're talking about red boxing, um, reportedly it no longer works. It stopped working in the early 90s, like 1993, 1994. Though I've heard recently that it still works in some places, um, even in America, I've heard it works still in Britain in some places and um, apparently for the longest time the legend has been that there's only one more payphone you can red box with and it's in Alaska though uh, recently I've been seeing stuff that makes me think otherwise hope you guys enjoyed that segment um, talking about the contest from last episode nobody ended up winning that contest so they didn't get to put a voicemail in my voicemail box however if you noticed in the last segment I dialed the same number using DTMF. Now, if you can decipher that phone number, call it, leave a message, I will put that message on the credits for the next episode, and that's my second contest. So let's see who can do that first. Now, we're going to get started with the next two segments, the first of which is a CED showcase, and then the second segment is building a portable radio station. Hope you like it. What I have here today are capacitance electronic discs. They're also known as CEDs or video discs. They're made for the Selectivision player by RCA. And uh, the titles I have here are The African Queen. Then I have The Godfather. I have this in two discs actually. The same movie, but it needs two discs. And then I have two different copies of MASH. But I believe they're the same movie. And now. Like I said, these are capacitance electronic discs, and uh, as the first word in that implies, these discs are essentially capacitors. Now, if you know anything about vinyl records, they have the record and then use a stylus, which picks up vibrations on the record, and then uses a transducer to convert the vibrations into music. Now, these discs are essentially big capacitors. The um, side of the disc that is read by a stylus, it picks up electrical energy directly from the disc and then it turns this 
into an FM signal which can then be used to get video and audio. Now these discs were designed by RCA in 1963 I believe is when they started working on these and they didn't have a product to release until 1981 so they spent over a decade working on these things and they were thinking about abandoning them however it, they were already millions of dollars into it so they had to finish it up or else they would lose a lot of money and um, upon launch there was about 50 titles and it kept growing um, good things about these are that they were in a way very early ways to get videos out to people and they were also pretty inexpensive at the time compared to other formats um, having said that though there were definitely flaws with it for example the discs when they were read by the machine it, they spin at about 450 rpm so if you were trying to pause the disc at a specific spot it wouldn't work the disc would be way too fast it could not stop to get that frame that you wanted so usually it would just stop and go to a blank screen um, other problems with this disc format is that you couldn't record anything onto them they were single play um, every side since it's like a record in here each side has 60 minutes of playtime so for large movies like this you would need two discs or for another example there's an hour on each side so after you watch an hour of the movie then you'd have to flip it over to watch the other part of the movie so you'd have to actually physically get up and change it and that was kind of a hassle and then you're also talking about you know VHS and Betamax were just coming out those you know consumer friendly they were getting inexpensive you could record a lot on them they were long you didn't have to change out tapes and you also had laser discs laser discs were like giant CDs I'll talk about them later and they could have much more stuff on them they could have different audio tracks they could have digital stuff go along this is just analog and then you also have the problem of the condition that the discs can get in um, RCA has said that video discs only last ideally about 500 plays when something like a laser disc you can have infinite number of plays and the problem is that dust gets onto the surface and it causes the disc to skip and then the stylus will also stop picking up the disc and it'll get dusty and it'll need replacing and these parts are harder and harder to find so the odds of actually finding a working select division are pretty slim unless you're willing to pay a bunch of money for them and now I'm actually going to show you the inside of one of these you can easily open them see this part right here this moves and makes a little bit of noise there's actually some holes in here for when you normally take this if you had a select division player you'd slide it in and then the disc would pop out this side here and then you'd pull out this casing this plastic casing and the disc would be in there on something called a spine which I'm going to show you in a second and to open up one of these if you have one you take a little jeweler screwdriver it doesn't really matter what kind it is as long as you can get it in here and you hold the disc and you put it in the crack in here and you push that in a little bit and you pop up this side and you do the same for the opposite side and it pops up here so you can see and the spine's a little shaky and the disc you have a shiny disc here that looks similar to a record I'll bring a, I have a random record over here for comparison about the same size I think they're both 12 inches and then so when this goes in the machine this record and the spine are in the machine together and the record is taken away from the spine and it's spun and actually if you look at the disc here there's a little warning about copyright protection on it which I think in a way is a little bit funny because nobody was really ever supposed to read these things You're not supposed to take them out then yeah you have the discs you can see the movies here all different kinds of discs I'm just saying that I use this movie here because I really probably wouldn't watch this movie but if you actually open the discs you you have a chance of damaging them somewhat like for example just probably having that out maybe expose it to dust or something or if I touch that disc or drop it that's probably bad too but these are select division video discs you don't really see these much anymore I think the first time I saw these I thought that they were something like from a TV station like they would be given copies of movies to play and this is what they'd be on but 
I ended up being wrong with that. These are actually just consumer products. And those are Selectivision video discs, also known as CEDs. Okay, in front of you, you see my modified FM transmitter. Now, some of you might be asking what I've done to it. Let me move it all into frame here. Now, you can see up here, this is the standard plug that it came with. Uh, by the way, this is a Dynex FM transmitter. It's a uh, Best Buy's brand of transmitter. It comes with four stations starting at 88.1 megahertz, and then it goes up incrementally. And here there's power button, and this here is not volume, this is fine tuning. And then here's the plug. You can plug this into any jack that uses an eighth inch connector, like an iPod or any sort of MP3 player, cassette player, CD player. As you can see here, I soldered on some leads that go from it to the board. The reason I did this is because this was actually breaking off of the board just from handling it. And what I did here is I just temporarily put on some uh, Cat5 cable to connect it all up. I would not recommend doing this permanently. So you, as you can see, that's kind of the connections are out here in the open, and this doesn't always provide the best sound signal. It can get messed up and it just doesn't sound as clean as normally so I'm probably going to take get like an eighth inch jack from Radio Shack and then cut it here and then put that into the jack and that's what I'll do for that um, I also did a little bit extending the battery pack here and um, if you're going to do this I recommend that you watch out because there's like hot glue and this is plastic so soldering in here isn't always the friendly environment uh, it takes two triple A's and it runs for a fairly long amount of time, a couple hours at least. Now here you see that I've added on some wire here, these black wires, which are used for an antenna. Now if you look closely, you can see that there's these little metal pads up here. There's three of them. And if you want to add an antenna like I did, you just have to solder one wire to one of the pads and then scratch away some of the PCB on the back and solder another wire there. That will give you ground and that makes this a dipole antenna because it has two poles. Now some of you may be asking first off how do you know what length to make the antenna wire? There's actually a fairly simple formula for this. Um, what you do is you take the speed of light and you divide it by what you're broadcasting on in Hertz so the speed of light is just a constant, you can look that up, and then you divide it by the number of hertz. For this I'm using 88.1 megahertz. So to convert from megahertz to hertz, I believe you multiply it by 10 to the 6th. So 88.1 times 10 to the 6th is the number of hertz. So speed of light divided by the number of hertz, and then you divide that number again by 4, and that will give you your length. Uh, for 88.1 megahertz, it is about 33 and a half inches probably 33.488 inches something like that uh, everything else is pretty similar a lot of people have said that the antenna length doesn't really matter as long as it's around that length somewhere between 33 and 34 inches and um, if you're wondering how I chose that channel out you're trying to find the channel that has the least amount of static there's only four that you can choose from and hopefully there's not that much in your area that could interfere with that. If you hear any kind of wisp from any other radio station, any sound at all interfering in the channel you want to use, don't use that channel. Now some of you also may be asking, is what this is legal? Uh, essentially you're making this a lot more powerful. Depending on where you are, this might violate some FCC regulations, but I think I'll take my chances on this one. It doesn't transmit that far. Um, when I tested this first, I had a antenna that I wasn't hooking up properly, and I got about, I think, 80 yards or so. And if you do the math with that, then that's uh, 240 feet. I bet with this antenna, it goes a little bit more. But I doubt that anyone's going to complain if you're doing it in that small of an environment. It's really not that big a deal. It's maybe the size of a football field in radius so I think you'll be okay with that so now I'm going to show you what you can do to set up your own portable radio station that you can take with you to any sort of event, a camping trip 
I originally wanted to use this for a charity event, only I wasn't able to use it because the event was moved indoors. And I'll show you how to do that right now. So now you can see I have the radio station set up here. It's all based around this, which is my mixer that I've showed before. It has four channels. I could hook a microphone up into this, but I won't for this demonstration. Um, one word of advice, if you're going to use a microphone, do not put it in front of any of the speakers for your radio station coming out. That'll create feedback, which not only sounds horrible, but it's probably not very good for your audio equipment. Now, I have these two sliders here. These can control the volume coming in from my MP3 player. You have a left channel and a right channel. I'll be showing that in a second. Now I have my two channels here, left and right, coming out of my mixer. And I'm choosing to use this radio right here as something of a preamp. You really don't need to do this. Um, I don't have a cable that I would normally be using that can go from RCA and then have a female jack for a one eighth inch so I can plug directly into my transmitter. Or what I could have done is I could also get one of these jacks and solder it directly onto the transmitter. But I haven't done this. I'll just be showing using this radio as a preamp. Now I have the RCA cables fed into the input of this radio. You might not have a radio that does this, but like I said, you can just go out and buy the cable. And then I have the transmitter going in here through the phone jack. So say I had headphones, I would normally put them in that jack, but I'm just using the phone jack for the transmitter. Now here is my listening radio. This is what you're going to be able to hear everything out. It has you know, a little knob for tuning here and that will help you get directly in to your channel because it doesn't have digital tuning. Now over here on my mixer I'm going to be using my mp3 player and playing a song here. Now you can see when I do this the song goes away and then I can do the volume now. Put left channel up high, no right channel. Right channel, no left channel. So that's how you would be using it with an MP3 player. And using this, you could also mix in, you could talk over the music, you could have, you know, there's, there's two jacks here on the back, so you could put in two MP3 players, total of four channels of sound. And uh, that's how you can do a mobile radio station. You could carry all this around with you. It's really not that big of a burden compared to having like a full-fledged radio station. You can temporarily set it up. You can temporarily dismantle it. It's really quite simple. And that's the portable radio station. All right, that's the end of the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, comments, criticism, then you can contact me, and I'll have information available for how you can do that. And uh, that's been the second episode of Obsolete. I hope to be making a third one soon. And uh, if you guys have any ideas, I'd like to hear them. I already have some stuff planned out, but I'm always open to new content. Alright, see you guys later.